Captain Jake Bikina of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. Congratulations on your recent promotion. Tell us where you're assigned and, and what you do on a daily basis. Yeah, good to be with you today, Julie. Uh, thank you uh, so much for that. Uh, congratulations. So I am here in our media relations office. I was formerly the sergeant in the media relations office, recently promoted to captain and uh, stayed in place. Uh, so now lead the efforts of our media relations office, which handles all public information, as well as public relations and internal communication uh, for the Kansas City Police Department. All right, let's get right to it. Your football team wins the Super Bowl. You're having a parade yet again to celebrate that accomplishment. Walk us through the day of the shooting. What stands out now that there's been some time that's passed, not much time, but what stands out to you from the communications perspective and your role that day? Yeah, so this was our, our third parade in the last five years that we have been part of. So we're, we're fortunate in that regard. Uh, we have, it's, it's a great time to be a Kansas City Chiefs football fan. Uh, planning parades is something that we've been part of for the last five or six years. Uh, we, we first played in an AFC championship game in 2019. So plans have been in place. And each year that we've had a parade, there have been some slight changes, some, some route-based, some operations-based, but largely the same parade route and the same rally location have, have been used for the, for the three parades. On the day of, it starts early for our team. Obviously, we want to be part of the historical record of our police department's contribution to the safety of a parade and the, um, the safe operation of a parade from start to finish. So we started that morning about 4 a.m. The parade was set to start at 11 a.m. So uh, officers have roll calls and they're out on their posts starting at about 5 a.m. So we wanna chronicle that. We wanna get the crowd as it grows. We wanna get those interactions. Um, this is something that uh, we remind our officers, you know, we've got hundreds of officers uh, out here. We had a total of um, about 650, and there was probably another 200 from surrounding agencies. Our message that morning as we made roll calls is this is, this is something to, to soak up. This is everybody's here for a positive reason. Everybody's here to celebrate. And we don't often get those interactions or those opportunities to have those interactions in a universally positive environment. So our message to the officers as they headed out there was, you know, soak this up, use this to charge your batteries, use this to, um, to gain energy as, uh, as, a, a, as a community interaction. And so that went on for several hours. The other thing we did from a public information standpoint was myself and another officer who's assigned as a PIO here in our office, uh, we made the rounds to all of the media locations where they were broadcasting the, uh, the setup of the parade and the, and the growing crowd. And we just kind of sat down, kind of gave them the rundown of you know, what kind of officer deployment we had, how many were there. And our goal in that was really you know, to inspire confidence in the, in the community, in the city, that this is, um, this is gonna be a, a safe, family-friendly environment. There's a lot of police down there and at the, at the rally and at uh, the parade route. And our message was that that's a good thing. You know, the police are here. We're, we're here to, to help the city celebrate. And that was really our strategy until the, the parade started. Um, once the parade began, public relations team uh, and photographers and videographers were out on the route again, um, creating that historical record, uh, the documentation of those, those interactions with our officers, uh, with the players and with um, the, the thousands and thousands of fans that were gathered there. From my perspective, public information wise, it's being broadcast live on all of the TV stations. So the, the better place to be in, in my strategically, in my opinion, is a little bit away from the actual crowd of people. Because once you're in the crowd of people, it's, it's hard to get out of the crowd of people in a, in a, um, in a uh, expedient manner. So I was actually back in my office uh, for, for the parade. I was watching it uh, on the live TV broadcast. I was watching the dispatch information. And then I had a, a police radio there that was kind of scanning the channels for the different locations on the route and in the overall command post. And that was basically how it went until about 1.50 uh, in the afternoon. Walk us through from the moment you figure out that there's been a shooting 
you're you're a captain, you're a high ranking member of this police department. Your mission for this major event is communications. So what do you do? Walk me through the minute you figure out what's happened and then what do you do? Yeah, so um, at, at 1.50 in the PM, the rally was coming to an end and on my TV to my right, I'm seeing uh, Travis Kelsey, Patrick Mahomes, the other chiefs, they're finishing their, their speeches, the crowd's cheering. And I hear on the radio, one of the officers that is uh, nearby the stage broadcast that he has multiple shots fired. And so just that, um, that convergence of those two things, like coming to the end of a celebration and then hearing multiple shots fired and knowing in your head that it's literally at the same location, your brain's got a lot of things to process all at once there. And so um, in my experience as a PIO, I've been kind of in the middle of a handful of things and uh, you, you start thinking, okay, what's happening? You start making mental notes of, of what you're hearing the officers are doing. And then you start thinking, how am I going to communicate that? So some of my first thoughts were, um, is this somebody shooting in the air? Is this um, uh, a group of people shooting at each other? Is this a coordinated attack of one or more shooters looking to cause as much harm as they can until they're stopped? And it was really a few minutes, honestly, of sort of um, of radio traffic that was um, sort of hard to interpret from not being there. Um, you know, while while people, we've got a combination of officers reporting what they're hearing and seeing, plus reports coming in from people dialing nine one one or stopping an officer and telling them what they're hearing and seeing, and that all you know goes into that sensory input about what taking place and and um uh, added into that a rare opportunity to, to have a sensory input of actually literally watching it live so i'm listening to the radio and to my right as i'm staring at my computer screen is the live broadcast of kshb 41 uh who is the official broadcast partner of the chiefs they're they're basically live streaming the crowd of people running away from the shooting scene and the, the best thing, it's a sickening feeling. Um, I can't describe it as anything else. It's a, it's a sickening feeling to watch that taking place, hearing the radio traffic, knowing what, what is taking place, and literally just seeing people uh, panic and run for their lives. Um, that, brought, that video has been played uh, probably hundreds of times in, in news clips in our city and across the country. Um, but they, uh, it, showed, it showed one thing in particular that I definitely made a note of that's you know, go, going to always be a part of the story in this situation. You see terrified faces running towards the camera and then you see the backs of police officers running away from where the camera was. And um, that's a, it's, a, it's a terrible tragedy that nobody ever wants to be in, but it's one it, that shows um, that there's a great number of, of men and women that, um, that sign up to do this job, that uh, their instinct is the exact opposite of self-preservation. It's, it's running towards uh, that danger. And for those first couple of minutes, they didn't know what the danger was exactly. We later learned that the shooting um, took place where dozens of rounds were fired over the course of um, 30 seconds to a minute, probably. And then, and then really it was everybody's frantic efforts to get away from the scene that caused some of the, the, the chaos at that point. Um, but the officers, they were running towards that. And there's, there's several images of officers running towards various locations, one of them being inside of Union Station as well, where we later learned there was, there was not any shots fired, but officers ran there. And just time and time again, you see the backs of police officers. And it's just, it's an amazing visual um, that, uh, that is, is part of the overall communication that goes in later whenever we're talking about um, what's the chief going to say. But um, that's one of the things that really stuck with me, um, seeing that visual and, and um, the, those initial tense moments, those officers running towards that danger and that gunfire. And as a tenured public information officer, you're making a mental note of that, one, because you are a commander, but two, because you know that in the course of telling the the news of this horrible event that that is one of the key messages so i want to get to what is your first form of communication and what was the length of time between when you figured it out you needed a few minutes to process it and understand what's going on on the radio how long did that take uh if i look at the timeline i think it was about seven minutes 
um, before. So we uh, we were able to get an email out to our local media distribution list and a tweet. Um, in my experience, um, it's one of the things that I've learned early on. Um, you know, you go to a lot of training, IECP, um, and IOA and others where um, they talk about, you know, crisis situations and crisis communication. Um, in, an, in an incident that you recognize is gonna be a national or international incident, the quicker you can drive everybody to that Twitter page or X, Twitter X, um, that, that's, your, that's your best and most efficient way of communicating in a, in a um, timeline type format, information that, that is easily uh, digestible and easily able to be gathered from anywhere in the world. And so we did the local notification and then everything else went to Twitter from there. Uh, part of the, the, original, um, the original information that I had heard is that two people were taken into custody. And so that was a piece of information that I wanted to, to relay to the community, as well as just, you know, it's, it sounds simple and obvious, but notifying people there has been a shooting at the site of this rally. Avoid that area. If you're in that area, clear out as soon as you can. There's going to be multiple officers in that area searching and providing for the safety of that area. Just giving that no notification. I mean, that's the basic stuff. You make the assumption of that, but it starts with that. Like, okay, where are we at? What are we doing? And what, what's happened? From a, if you look at the landscape of the, the different ways that you're communicating, your biggest challenge was the traditional media as compared to social media. Correct. Yeah. So social media was, um, you know, you can kind of control the flow there. It's it's you control the uh, the information, the posting, the times you keep it in your timeline. Obviously, you know, local media is going to do what they're going to do. They um, this isn't a matter of they're hearing on scanner or they're getting a tip called into their newsroom. They just watched it with everybody else on live TV. So their deployment and their um, information gathering is not a slow buildup like it may be in like we're hearing of 911 calls right. or hearing on the scanner that something's going on at the mall. Uh, this was an instant all hands on deck deployment for them from inside their newsroom and from their, their teams that were on the ground. Um, this was kind of rare in that regard, you know. A lot of the um, mass casualty, mass shooting incidents that, that, that I read about and that, that we think about, um, they started with a 911 call. You know, somebody's at the school, somebody's at the mall, somebody's at the grocery store. And then it's a slow buildup from there. This was, um, this was the difference between a gasoline engine and an electric car. An electric car, when you stop on the gas, it's all the power instantly. And that's kind of what we felt coming from initially those local media outlets. Um, they were calling, texting, emailing instantly everything that they had. And um, that's that distraction. You got to you got to kind of stay focused and stay conversational with the people in the room and know that the phone's happening and there's going to be a time to get at that. But um, but focusing on unification of message and having everybody on the same page and getting that information coming in from those places where uh, where the information is, but whether it's the emergency operations center, the command post, or on the ground with the officers that are literally dealing with the situation. You had local news, you had national, you had local sports, you had national, you had international media there. Why in this particular crisis was the media more challenging for you to manage or navigate than social media? Um, I, I think it goes back to that, uh, that analogy that I that I gave a minute ago. Um, I think most situations that end up being a mass casualty situation or a mass shooting situation, um, they they start slower or different in some way. So the um, pace. Yes, it was just it was the pace of it. it. It was already we had an EOC up and running. We had a command post. We had an operations plan. We had media streaming around the world this event. I mean, the, there's nothing bigger than the NFL. And when you sprinkle in the enhancement of the, the Taylor Swift effect um, right, on this right. team in particular, um, there, there, were eye, there were eyes from around the world on this event already, and they're watching it unfold. And so the pressure on those media outlets to get some explanation of what they just watched, it had to have been um, much higher from their side as well. And, and, and we felt that like, I've never lost control of my email inbox the way that I did at several increments over those next two days. 
um, just from the, you know, we, we do all of our, we do our media inquiries through email and um, literally in the time that I would try to, we had two or three, um, once everything's settled, I might be getting ahead of myself, but once everything's settled, we had two or three responses to, you know, the time, the basics of the incident, the number injured, so on. And I, I had them on a Word document and it was just a cut and paste for, for um, consistency and expediency. And in the time I would cut and paste an inquiry answer, three more would come in just in that short amount of time. And that, that happened two or three times over that next day, um, day or two. And that, that kind of pressure I had never experienced before, just that insurmountable pressure coming from media outlets from around the world. So because of that, did you consider, I, I can't get to all the media, so we're only gonna push it out on social media. Correct, yeah, we did, we did do that. Um, we focused on social media and uh, to the extent that we had downtime in between briefings or so on, or when, when information gathering had stabilized, we did make a good attempt at least to kind of go back and at least direct those people where they could find information. Um, just knowing that this, this was, it, it, depending on how things played out, this was gonna be a, a multi-day at least, um, you know, national level or international level news incident. Was there, you know, so often there's an adversarial relationship between law enforcement and the media, although it's getting better. Were there moments that you think would be helpful to share that were either highlights of the way you interacted with members of the media or lowlights that would be helpful for people to know? Um, yeah, a couple of things. So the, the media, need, they're coming um, and, you, and they need to know where to go and, and where they can set up. And so... We were able to communicate that again through social media and through our local media connection, uh, our, our distribution list. We had them set up really well. One thing I, I learned, um, you know, you're not going to think of everything. And at, at the end of the first day, we kind of um, everybody was on the same page. We touched base. We're like, OK, we're ready to go home and we'll and we'll start again tomorrow morning early. And I, I didn't anticipate the gravity of the, the literal news trucks that were, that were on the road on the way to town here. And so um, we, had a, we had an area set up that was, that was plenty for our local uh, outlets. But then overnight, the officers that were um, on the, the crime scene security and the perimeter security, they were experiencing very large, very intricate news vehicles. And and their, you know, their traffic and their patrol officers, and they're not that 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 uh, that's intimidating to them. And so, um, it, if I had it to do again, one of the things I would do is is leave some briefing instructions for uh, those perimeter officers and just let them know what's coming. Hey, new, CNN news truck, Fox News news truck, whatever it is, uh, you, you see that pull up. Here's where they go. Just put them there, and then they'll know what to do from there. Um, that it created a little bit of, you know, it, it, all it really did was create several phone calls for overnight uh, for us to handle from those officers. But that was one thing proactively that, um, that I didn't anticipate the gravity of. As far as adversarial, um, our we have a great relationship with our local news. Um, all of them have their own personalities. They're all kind of like their own fraternities or sororities. Um, they, have their, they have their personalities. They have their quirks but we've got a great system here and they knew what to expect from us because they've been through serious events with us before. Um, we've talked about it. Um, we have, I have all of the news directors. I have their numbers. I, I know, um, I know them well and we get together frequently. Uh, those relationships are key. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those things I kind of take for granted now, but if, if you're starting off in a, in a market like this, building those relationships, take the time now to do it because you'll need it later. The nationals are, um, they're less invested as well. They don't have to deal with us next week. Um, they just need their information. They need it now. And so we know they're going to be more abrupt, more to the point, um, maybe a little bit more pushy, uh, maybe is one way to say it. Um, so we did experience that a little bit. But um, the, the cool thing about uh, our locals is, you know, they, they stood up for themselves. Um, there's uh, there's some, some great photos of from the first day to the second day, the um, the media um, grouping outside of our headquarters uh, it it probably quadrupled. Maybe that's and maybe that's an underestimate. Um, but the the locals kind of stood up for themselves and they um, they they weren't letting the national news outlets. I won't name any in particular, but 
uh, some of them came in with their own personality and their own uh, agendas and pushiness and um they, they know we've got a way of doing things here and 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 a way of being fair and and making sure that everybody's going to get their information. And so uh, the locals did a good job of staying on their ground when when some of these big name national outlets came in and 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 thought that they would, you know, exert their will. Right. How many PIOs did you have originally, and then did that grow? Yeah. So um, there were two of the three of us here uh, at that time. Um, our our plan was. Uh, any any large scale event, we uh, we try to all be there uh, to the extent that we can. Um, one we 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 had some turnover in in uh, in our team, and so one of our PIOs had a previously scheduled uh, vacation time um, at at that at that point, and so uh, he was gone, but the two of us were there, and uh, we um, you know we we got through it uh, with the two of us. Um, there's uh, we, We've had, in my time here, we have had four officers. I was the sergeant and we had had five captains. So turnover and um, new orientation is not something that, that I'm any kind of stranger to. So um, working with varying levels of, of experience and, um, and, and just you know, experience with particular incidents is, is not something out of the ordinary. So uh, we had short answers. We had two and uh, the two remained throughout the course of pretty much um, the uh, first three days of it, basically. Um, and then we kind of went back to taking turns of who was handling inquiries and things. How did you sleep and <laughs> how long was the news cycle? How many days were you at high alert? Yeah, so news cycle was this happened uh, two o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday. It was Two full days, uh, probably Friday afternoon, and the the thing that that calmed it down. Um, sorry, the lights just went out in the room. I haven't been moving enough. Um, here we go. They're coming back on. You the thing three, that calmed Jake, it down. Jake, you said three days: Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. That's it. Correct. Wednesday afternoon, and then Thursday afternoon, and then to Friday afternoon. Um, the thing that that started to calm it, we knew that uh, we had reported that we had people in custody. And in the state of Missouri, uh, an adult, you have 24 hours to charge uh, in a felony investigation or they have to be released pending further investigation. So that first cycle was up against that 24 hour um, window. Now, what ended up happening in this situation was the two people we initially had in custody, they were juveniles. And so the juvenile um, system works a little bit differently, um, pluses and minuses, and I'll get to that here in a second. The plus of a juvenile system is that uh, a juvenile can be held for criminal investigation at the discretion of the, uh, the juvenile judge and the justice system. And there's not that 24 hour rule here in the state of Missouri. So the investigative pace um, was a little bit different. They were able to kind of take their time a little bit on that. There was not that rush up against that 24 hour period. The two juveniles that were initially in custody were charged that Friday afternoon. And uh, what I would what I would tell somebody in this situation is if, if you have people in custody, the, the next page, you turn that page when charges are filed. Mm -hmm. And and really, that's the first time that you're able to kind of offload some of your um, that media. It, it, all of it is focused at you until those charges are filed. And then you're able to offload that a little bit. And then the prosecutor starts to kind of take that a little bit. And so um, like relationships with the media are important. Relationships with your prosecutors and your prosecutors communications teams are huge because you're literally going to be passing the baton to them and you need to know when they're announcing what they're doing and they need to know what you're saying leading up, up to it. Now with the juvenile system, it's a little bit more challenging because their information is, is, is very protected um, to include even ages. So, Essentially, the, the juvenile circuit court that was the charging authority in this situation uh, didn't say very much more than there are two juveniles and they are charged. Wow. And that was really it. So I didn't get that real big offload of, of pressure that I might get in an adult situation where charging documents are included, PC right. statements are included, and a lot more details for the media to pour over. So they kind of looked over there for a second. Okay, cool. They're charged. Now back to us. Okay, so what's next? 
um, that did, did start to relieve that pressure a little bit once those two charges were filed um, and leading into the weekend. I would say the, the Nationals kind of packed up and left after those first charges were filed. So it was a good two full days of National. Um, they, they were still checking in, obviously, multiple times a day, but that was more of a desk and an email check-in, um, not like a call from the front desk at headquarters saying, hey, there's a camera crew out front. What do I do with them? So uh, that it, two days is the short answer to how long did the 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 main um, the, the the main cycle last? Okay, last question. We have to wrap up already. What's the number one thing you would say to a police chief or a sheriff or a public information officer, no matter where they work in law enforcement in this country, to get ready for something as as horrible as you experienced? Um, planning. You know, it it sounds cliche, but planning ahead. It's time. Um, my chief, I, I am so lucky. My chief has been in my seat. She has been the captain in the media relations office. She knows the media cycles. She knows the media game. We can speak the same language quickly. Uh, if your chief is not somebody who speaks that language, it's on you to educate them, let them know what a situation like this is going to look like. Take half a day and do a table talk like your guys. Bring in a media professional. Uh, if you if you don't have one in your on your staff, we have a we have a senior public relations specialist that was 15 plus years in the media. Uh, he was so key in this situation to say, OK, here's what they're going to do next. Here's what they're saying in the newsroom. Here's how they're going to cover that. If you don't if you're if you're a smaller agency and you don't have that put together a tabletop exercise, I guarantee you there's somebody in your local uh, in your local area that'll work with you on that. But the chief needs to know. When the bullets start flying, when the cars start crashing, when the buildings start coming down, whatever it might be, collapses, uh, the national na uh, natural disasters, whatever those things are, when that starts happening, that's not the time to start figuring out what we're going to do. You need to know where you're going to go, who needs to be in the room at the table, and what information are you going to need, and then how quickly are we going to talk about it? Uh, those things all need to be talked about, and it shouldn't be a struggle to start thinking about and 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 um, and doing that tabletop exercise then, because there's just too many there's too many voices in the room at that point in time if you're asking everybody's opinion. That's so true, Captain Jake Bikini with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your experiences with all of the PoliceOne.com viewers and readers. Appreciate it. Stay safe. Thank you.